Good afternoon and uh, happy 51st Earth Day. I'm so pleased to be here today with Nadia Swarovski, the chair of the Swarovski Foundation. I'm Sarah Kozlowski of the CFTA. And this afternoon, Nadia and I are going to discuss the incredible work that she has led, uh, the long partnership between Swarovski and the CFDA supporting talent, our shared vision of nurturing talent into the future around sustainable innovation and, and much more. So thank you, Nadia, for making time to talk with us today. I'm so honored and, and pleased to talk with you. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you. And yes, indeed, happy Earth Day to you and everyone who's listening. I think it's a wonderful day to have this conversation on. It is, and I, I, I think one of the first things I'm so excited to hear you discuss with us is, uh, in addition to your, your relationship with the CFDA, your relationship with the United Nations. And uh, we were just chatting this morning, uh, is a remarkable first step with the US being back in conversation globally. It was a virtual uh, climate summit and the US has pledged 50% uh, carbon reduction by 2030. As you well know, it's the decade of action. And as we work to meet the sustainable development goals of 2030, uh, we have quite a ways to go, but it's invigorating uh, and lots of uh, understanding of the importance of innovation. Uh, and Nadia, uh, I've admired your work tr truly for so many years. I remember being at UN events and just being just really, truly inspired. And I uh, would love for you to share uh, just the genesis of, of your journey around sustainability and, and your leadership with the UN. Well, thank you so much. No, I have to say it's so great to be here. And um, I just echo what you said just about the leadership and the commitment that the United States has expressed today. And that's so important, you know, that the leadership um, expresses their values because it's just so much easier for the country to follow or people to follow. And I think what we've all done, the CFDA, um, private organizations, uh, corporate organizations, is we've really tried to express our values within our leadership. And um, we've tried to step in where perhaps the government didn't necessarily um, share its voice or share perhaps the correct voice. Um, but I think just more in the sense of really making sure that everyone's voice is heard and ensuring that it's clear that every individual can also contribute to the betterment of the environment. Um, and certainly that in consideration for people and for planet. And, um, you know, in our, first of all, and I also want to say here, it's been, our relationship with the CFDA has been incredibly important. It's been incredibly important to me because um, I really started my career working for Eleanor Lambert, who was the founder of the CFDA. And it's, she was 92 when I worked for her and it was amazing to see that incredible mind and soul in action, you know, and her intention was always to improve, to improve, to get people together, to connect people. In a certain sense, I'm copying Eleanor also, you know, in a lot of the work that I have done. And, you know, I just, we just really embrace the arena of co-creation of collaboration. And so therefore, you know, the CFDA has always been an incredible collaborator and um, helped realized the vision of supporting young creative talent and uh, we had a wonderful relationship partnership for 18 years um, the last three years we were so excited to have the award of positive for positive change which really highlighted individuals like Dion, uh, Kenneth Cole, Donna Karen for their individual positive contribution to the industry. Um, and we really believe that that is what it takes in order to um, have that impact of one's work and also be contagious to the community around one. And then I just also want to express, it's been so exciting to witness the emerging talent that the CFD has supported, that we have certainly supported at Swarovski, and to see that some of them now are on the board of the CFDA, like Philip Lim and Prabal. And, you know, it just seemed like yesterday, those were those young kids on the block. And look at them now. Now they're leaders, not just creative leaders, but they have a very strong social commitment. And I just think it's absolutely fantastic. And um so we're so happy to join forces once again with this new scholarship program that really focuses on sustainability within fashion in particular and, uh, 
as are we, uh, and I recall, you know, it's, it, it's in pandemic time, I think the 2019 CFDA awards where Eileen Fisher was recognized through the positive uh, change to Oscar award was a, a, just a very memorable moment. And as you mentioned, uh, two CFDA board members, Kapil Garam and Philip Lin, I think have been very active in your sustainability initiatives in the past and in going forward. And Nadia, um, with the uh, Swarovski Foundation, uh, which was established uh, almost a decade ago in, in 2013, and mm -hmm. now you're stepping into this, this role at the helm and everything is headlined around sustainability, ingenuity, creative capital. Um, what brought you to that precipice? Uh, again, thinking of the conversations this morning from global leaders, uh, I think everyone in our audience today agrees there's a moral imperative, a strategic imperative, but your, your personal uh, vision and, and journey, I'd just love to hear more. I have to say, you know, I've always just only stepped into the footsteps of my forefathers, you know, in terms of fashion. My grandfather always told me about working with Coco Chanel and Christian Dior. And then by the time it was my turn to work in the business, I was looking for my grandfather's equivalent of Christian Dior. And that just happened to be Alexander McQueen. Um, and then in terms of, you know, the foundation, it was really my great, great grandfather, Daniel Swarovski who was incredibly philanthropic. He was actually an immigrant from Bohemia, which was indigenous to crystal cutting, but he wanted to get away from all the competition of crystal cutting, moved to Austria. He strategically chose the town of Wattens because it had a very strong um, stream that came out of the mountain. And he actually used that water power to power his machines. Um, but you know, you know, he came to Austria with an invention, but he certainly needed the people to help him. So it was a very symbiotic situation between him, the inventor, the people who made um, his vision turn reality, and he made sure to give back. You know, and um, he had uh, created a housing system. He created a um, bonus system that was just unheard of in 1895. Um, he created the band, he um, wife cooked for the employees, you know, eventually that turned into an official canteen. So, you know, that giving back to the local community has been very important to Swarovski from day one. And then in terms of our manufacturing, because we are in these beautiful Tyrolean Alps, this beautiful green environment, we just always felt that the environment should never be compromised by our manufacturing. So we have certainly invested a lot of brain power and finances in ensuring that we have a green, a green and sustainable manufacturing. And we have actually shared this knowledge also with other organizations, you know, just again, recognizing that this is something for the greater good. Um, so to set up the foundation was a, very, was a natural and, um, we really, uh, the difference between the foundation and the organization is really that we can express our human values. And the foundation sits on three pillars. We really uh, focus on education, which really also means um, culture, creativity, innovation, that kind of support, then human empowerment. Here we're thinking of the Swarovski customers. 90% of our customers are women. What is it that the company can do to give back to its customers? So we have various, we support various different organizations from female health related organizations to human rights related organizations. And then the final pillar is nature and environment. So we have um, certainly focused on a lot of water organization. We have a wonderful partner in the Nature Conservancy. They certainly lead the way. Um, we just, I, I personally am very fond of the Nature Conservancy or Conservation International, which um, consists of board members that are very educated. They've been very successful in their careers, whether it's a financial career and so on, but they have now followed, or they're now following their passion, which is, um, the care and consideration for the environment. And it's wonderful to see that brain power uh, come together into a greater cause of really protecting our planet. And um, it's been wonderful to work with our partners and we've connected our partners with each other also. Again, we totally believe in that kind of ethos of collaboration, of information sharing. And I must say here also, one major partner or support was the UN. So Swarovski has been a member of the Global Compact since 2011. And there you have the 10 principles, 
from anti-slavery to transparency in the supply chain and so on. And that's been incredibly helpful to Swarovski as an organization. Eventually, we then signed on to the UN Women Empowerment Principles. There are seven principles really focused on females um, at work. And we've rolled these out, out internationally within our HR departments. Um, then the UN uh, communicated their UN SDGs, the unit uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, Swarovski supports eight of those goals. And that really has been an incredible anchor for us. You know, those goals uh, go from um, education for everyone, um, equality, life above land, life below water, and so on. And we've identified these goals also within the various different partners that we support, you know, as our common denominator. And certainly one goal for Swarovski is to communicate these goals, um, you know, to the general public. I certainly want my children to know about those goals and what they are. I think that the goals speak to a very universal language. They're very understandable, but it just, it's, it's that beacon that people can follow. You know, it's the light at the end of the tunnel. And as you were saying earlier, it's so important for governments to express their goals, but it's also great to have institutions like the UN to set out certain goals and, and make them very easily um, adherable or followable. Of course, it's never a requirement, it's just a guideline. They really truly are since being launched, uh, I guess six years ago, uh, roughly, become a universal blueprint. Uh, and it, it's amazing to see the work that you align to and all of, of your initiatives, which I think brings me to wanting to hear from you about the vision for Creative Square Future. Uh, it's so exciting, everything that I've read, and I would just uh, love if you could share with us, you know, how did that come to be? And, and also, what gives you the most hope? What do you hope can come from these new initiatives you're launching? Well, I think in general, my hope is really that in um, the human heart, mind, and soul. I think uh, humans have been so intelligent. They've overcome adversity and I think we are now in a huge dilemma I mean it's we're feeling it with the environment and um, I am certainly counting on the younger generation to come up with the solutions or let's put it this way I'm counting on my children to come up with the solutions you know including my son coming up with the beaming machine and <laughs> reverse osmosis for the water because did you know only one percent of the world's water is actually drinkable we have a lot of work to do um, but in, in any case, um, in terms of the creatives of our future, you know, our collaborations with Swarovski within the various different industries, fashion, jewelry, architecture, has been so fascinating. And as the years progressed, um, the work of the designers have be has become increasingly more um, sustainably orientated. So then, then channeled into the foundation where, you know, versus working within Swarovski, where Crystal was really the subject matter, now really working in the um, our new programs within the foundation, it's really sustainable materials that are the subject matter. Sustainable, either sustainable materials, whether it's lab-grown leather, uh, lab-grown um, uh, fabric, which we've seen, uh, for example, with a collaboration that we had last year with Philip Lim and um, the young scientist McCurdy. Um, to um, really um, energy efficient ways of creating things. And um, we've created this new um, program, which is absolutely global, it's very international. Um, we have um, interviewed 375 applicants uh, between the ages of 18 and 25. And we have a wonderful list of mentors who are have been wonderful collaborators in the past. and. Um, these mentors are giving their time to educate these um, 15 recipients. And alone for these recipients to be in touch with the mentors is already such an incredibly empowering uh, situation. So Philip and Prabhupada have kindly offered to be mentors such as also um, Craig Robbins who heads up Design Miami. So really people from these incredibly um, cutting edge uh, design driven environments. And um, we're very curious to see what these young 
minds come up with, critical thinkers come up with, um, creating products in a more sustainable way. It touches on such uh, interesting, uh, well, the importance, obviously, of collaboration, not only across sectors, because you've mentioned, you know, in addition to fashion, science, technology, um, and other creative sectors, such as architecture or other design pathways, but the collaboration across generations uh, is something that uh, I don't know if you agree, is, is very energizing to see just uh, the activism and the voice of youth making a demand and also just their ingenuity partnered with the expertise and and you know the the, the, the skill sets of other generations I mean you put it all together so that important be possible right yes no and I have to say the young generation really has the advantage of learning from the experience of the older generation you know and I mean for us it's always been really important to work with emerging talent or design students why because they're sitting on the on the pulse of everything you know they have this this incredible sensibility or sensitivity towards the trends towards the zeitgeist and um it's really that sensitivity that we want to embed in products or invention and creations so i think it's a really good um symbiosis not just between the different generations but also between the different cultures you know, um, and I have to say design certainly is a universal element or fashion design, but then also our, our quest to protect our environment, right? That is very um, international universal. And that's perhaps one thing also, one element that has been a silver lining in this entire COVID lockdown is that actually our communication has increased and it's been so facilitated. Um, through our electronic means. And I think perhaps, um, you know, time differences don't matter so much anymore. And um, we all have the same size screen. So I think there is a wonderful democratization here as well, you know, but certainly communication was able to flow and, you know, um, it's propelled us forward into the future a lot faster. It absolutely has. Uh, and on the, the subject of screens, I want to acknowledge to our audience and uh, again to you, Nadia, that I live near a school uh, and they are having recess. So I very much apologize, uh, but also am uh, encouraged by the fact that they're there. Um, and I think we'll both speak as loudly as we can to amplify our voices uh, because of that. Um, so you're I talking about a little bit norm, Sarah. I think that's yeah. <laughs> you know, I have to think that's another wonderful silver lining. You know, people have been at home, people have seen their children, you know, and um I know there a lot of people have suffered under tension of having everyone under one roof, but quite frankly, you know, I think here it the challenge was to shift the thinking to this is my community, my family is my community. I'm so grateful for that. You know, I think the thinking of gratitude is also something that just has been absolutely increased during this time, you know, the power of our thoughts and how we um, direct them. Absolutely. So I love the sound of your children. It's great. <laughs> Uh, Nadia, do you think that, you know, I, I think there's a sense of collective purpose. I mean, that, that oh, wait, through this is the same. As you talk about your children, I talk about my dad. Would you like to come in? There he is. So my father doesn't know what I'm doing, but everyone, this is my father, Helmut. He Hello. has been uh, in charge of Swarovski's manufacturing for how many years, Bobby? Oh, 40. About 40 years? 45 years, I 45 think. 45 years? <laughs> and he just more, retired. More. So, 50, 54 years exactly. But I'm just talking to the CFDA here. Remember Stan and Eleanor Lambert. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> but we're just live. Okay, I see. <laughs> Good to meet you. I, I'm grateful to be under the same roof my, with my parents. <laughs> and then in Florida. <laughs> Down the street. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Mm. you know, Nadia actually here and tell you that lunch is ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I haven't had lunch in my working career in the last 25 years. <laughs> oh, no, that's not good. Well, wellness is very important. 360 wellness. But, you know, actually, uh, and also to the audience, please uh, feel free to type in questions because at the end of the conversation, uh, hopefully we have time uh, to yeah. hear from you. No. Uh, 
great to Nadia, but Nadia, on the subject of students in schools, or just on school, um, tied into the history of Swarovski's work, and you're speaking about, you know, the deep relationship with nature. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, the water school? I know that you're, you know, you, you've done so much deep commitment, but there's an increased set of, um, of goals going forward. Absolutely. And so because, as I mentioned earlier, water was so instrumental to my great grandfather's manufacturing and also water is that we use a lot of water for the cutting process of the crystal. Um, and it was my father who really kind of um, um, superly improved the uh, filtration system of the water that goes back out into the river. Um, so we started the water school 20 years ago, initially in Austria. Eventually this program has rolled out into China, Africa, India, South America, North America, Mississippi. Um, and uh, the mission of the water school is actually to support teachers to teach children about water, whether it is scarcity, whether it is flooding, whether it's pollution, sanitation. And, um, What's been so interesting and fascinating about the water school is that as we teach the children about the subject of the water, they as individuals experience this incredible sense of empowerment because they're suddenly realizing as children, as an individual, they can contribute to making the problem better. And money is not an objective. And, um, all of this is expressed very well in the movie Water School, which you can see on Netflix. We worked with UCLA's film department and their graduate students to create, to document the water school, but actually with a lens on girls and how girls are actually affected by the water and how they feel about water, about their environment um, and towards their local communities. And it's amazing. It's so positive. It's uplifting. And um it's also a project where the children come together and work as a group. They work with each other. They have, they create this, these communities and the support system of each other, but really um, it is the education about what is going on. And if you see water school, what's so fascinating is uh, we've worked with a school in Illinois next to the Mississippi and a lot of those students have never even stuck their finger into the Mississippi. I mean, there was such a disconnect between nature and that environment. So that's another call to action, you know, to, to really encourage people to feel at one with nature, to understand nature. Um, and that really led us to support other organizations. For example, the Jane Goodall organization, which has a wonderful program called Roots and Shoots. And it's really um, working with city children and, um, you know, it has little programs of planting and potting and actually learning about flora and fauna. And I think just for city children to be aware of their environment um, creates a greater connection between them and nature, but also creates a greater motivation to ensure that the environment is taken care of. Um, and certain um, initiative initiatives of um you know changing our practices are implemented so for example in the water school um we're encouraging children from emerged um societies to actually influence their buying decisions so there's certain toothpastes or um body scrubs that contain small mi microplastics and you can that's just a buying decision whether you buy a different toothpaste or a different body scrub to avoid uh, the microplastics going into the water. Um, we talk about recycling, you know, and these are all tiny little initiatives that anyone can do. Money, again, is not an, ob an, um, an objective here. So it really, truly makes the younger generation empowered um, to feel that they can contribute positively to the issues out there. Um, in terms of, you know, water, also we're working with the uh, Water Alliance, uh, we're working with Conservation International, um, also the Nature Conservancy, um, and I'm hoping to hear yet even more positive news from the American government just in terms of um, how the, the American bodies, uh, water bodies are treated and what pollutants are allowed to go into the water. As you just heard from my father, yes, I'm down the street from you. I am in Florida. 
And it's just unbelievable to see how the Indian River here is polluted and it's really due to the fertilizers. So, you know, and we know that there are more environmentally friendly um, plant support out there versus toxic fertilizers. Again, that it, it just needs to become a conscious discussion, a con conscious um, awareness um, of us all, what's happening, what's out there and uh, what we can do to make a difference. Absolutely. I mean, we, as we stand, knowing that I think that the U.S. alone contributes over 15% of the global CO2 emissions, and we know very well how important it is for policy and lawmakers to lead us towards change. But as you said, with pollution and, and, and plastic use, so we need that that support as well. Um, and thinking about, you know, uh, just jumping back to Creatives for Our Future and the CFDA and Swarovski and our new uh, journey ahead together centered on education and sustainability. Um, maybe if, do you want to share the news of, of what I, we are working on together, the new scholarship? Yes, so we're so and please you know let's hear it from you too but in any case we're excited we're so excited about the scholarship it's a three-year program and um the committee will select the students from amazing institutions. And again, you know, we empower them and trust in their brain power to come up with sustainable or sustainably created products and materials and um, end results. And I have to say, it's really um, the CFDA will come to it with such an amazing lens. And please now, Sarah. I want to hear yes. from your point of view. Oh, it means so much to us and, and, and to me personally. Again, I, I've admired the work of Swarovski and Sustainability for many years. And uh, the CFTA this year is celebrating 25 years of support to education. In 1996, there was a scholarship established directly with Parsons through Perry Ellis and has since grown. So um, to have uh, Swarovski's support as we really move into you know the future and increasing our commitments we've awarded uh, over 302 scholarships to date but uh you know i don't think that that anything can ever be enough in terms of the financial support uh needed to to offset cost of education but as you said we will be working with uh, 20 design schools nationally and i think that in addition to the scholarship it's that experience of you know the mentorship that we will be providing to the scholar and immersing them in you know some of these conversations around uh gender equity uh environmental justice um you know there, there's a huge economic barrier to to sustainability in many arenas but on the other hand we're on the forefront of a some call like the the, the next industrial revolution so mm -hmm. we talked about material innovation and and there's just so many opportunities and so hopefully this scholarship will help to propel and activate some of those ideas into future realities. No, and I, I think it's amazing. And I think it's so great that that's, you know, the CFDA is such an authority um, within that space. And there is my father again. <laughs> Hello. Miss Weston. Oh, thank you. Um, what do you see ahead as, as the, you know, what, what, I guess, to keep what is top of mind for you i don't want to say what keeps you up at night i think there are so many uh you know converging uh challenges that, that we're all navigating as as human beings and as in you as a leader leading with purpose but but what is really top of mind uh as you look to the future okay so you know again i just would like to say so here we're working from home <laughs> My father came in, he probably wouldn't have interrupted again, but he had to give me a message that Mrs. Web Weston called. And as you might know, um, Galen Weston just passed away. And um, I remember when I was working with Eleanor Lambert, she created the best dress list. And that's how I found out first about um, Hillary and Galen Weston, because they were often number one on that list. But um, just to answer, I'm weaving this into your question about leadership, you know, and I would just actually like to do a shout out to Galen and Hillary Weston. They've been such incredible leaders. To me, they've been incredible role models. Um, sustainable, as you know, they own Selfridges, and I think it's really amazing what Selfridges is doing also in terms of bringing awareness to the environmental issues 
they have, for example, a no fur policy. Um, they have, I really admire the Westons in terms of their philanthropy, giving back, you know, business with a tremendous purpose, but also giving back. Um, so I have to say that's my, um, that has been my leadership role model. And, you know, in terms of leadership, I really am so excited about this next generation because I think now more than ever, values have become so important, you know, whether it's family values, certainly the values about the environment, values towards people, values towards our environment. And um, I'm really so thrilled about the education and the knowledge and the information that's out there. I am thrilled that the young students will be exposed to that. Um, and now what I meant to say earlier, I'm so proud of the CFDA and the incredible um, platform they have been for so many young students, but also I think the entire fashion industry feels really protected uh, by the CFDA, by the institution of the CFDA. So, and now just to really um, see the CFDA support these, uh, absolutely what's right, the right way forward in terms of sustainability is absolutely phenomenal. And we're just, we're so honored about this partnership and so proud, really amazing. Mm -hmm. So hopefully America will lead the way in terms of this for other countries, you know, the British Fashion Council, the German Fashion Council has been wonderful. They've been um, also very sustainably minded, but I think, you know, um, America has been just such a leader in so many ways um, and certainly this institution. Oh, that means so much because you have a vantage point like no one else. I mean, you have been working globally uh, you know, in everything that you do and deeply within sustainability. Uh, and it's so kind uh, to hear that that America, that, that we're sort of, you know, we're back. I think they were saying this morning, what can you share with us? What do you see, you know, through your lens, uh, having this opportunity to engage with stakeholders, you know, around the world? Uh, you have a strong relationship with the British Fashion Council. You know, you, you're very active in the World Economic Forum and going to Davos. And, can you share with us some some insights on what you're seeing? Yes, well, I have to say, well, speaking of the World Economic Forum, another thing I did want to mention is, you know, they um, have their gender gap report. And last year's gender gap report stated that it will take 99.5 years to achieve equality. And one thing that certainly also unfortunately did happen in this COVID crisis is that that gap has actually increased. The 21, the gender gap, gap 21 report states that it will take 135.6 years for this gap to be closed. So um, I think there's some work to be done, but again, I'm almost, I'm just really counting on education to um, close that gap. Um, I think as so many of us, in particular in the fashion industry, you know, we, we think and see creativity. We don't see other elements. We don't necessarily see gender or color at all. You know, it's about the final result and that's the cre creative output. Um, I wish that would be the same in many other industries. Um, and therefore also I would like to just really commend the efforts of, um, again, people from the fashion industry in terms of the various different um, equal justice initiatives or um, for example, also the Womankind Initiative, which we're also so happy to be able to support with the foundation. And I have to say, it's just shocking. It has, it's shocking to me um, that certain elements exist and are going on, you know, it's, but I'm sure we will overcome all of that. Um, I think just from a global point of view, America is so lucky. And the reason why I'm here in the United States is because I'm so scared to go back to Europe. I'm scared to go back to Europe because I'm scared of the lockdown. And America is so lucky to have been vaccinated. I mean, I by chance walked into a CVS and I asked if they had an extra vaccine and they did. So I got myself vaccinated. Yeah, in Europe, people have no dates yet. In Austria, people have no dates. It's just really, um, it's really terrifying actually. So again, this is, I mean, to me, a sign that America is such a strong superpower you know, America invested in the vaccinations. For example, the Pfizer is, a, you know, no, it was developed in Germany, but Germany doesn't even have the vaccinations, you know, to the extent that North America has. So 
I think America is very, very lucky. I think we're very lucky to live in a free um, economy. From a global point of view, I'm a little bit scared what's happening in Eastern Europe, Ukraine. So, and that's totally beyond our control. So again, just speak, speaking with you and speaking in the, in the space of fashion and um, really in a very free world, we are so lucky to have that freedom and please let it be down to us to really make that positive um, difference and, and be active about it. And, um, you know, it's certainly our mission to educate people about uh, what the issues are and what they as individuals can do. So that's just from a bird's eye point of view, you know, what it is we can do and the freedom that we actually do have. So. Uh, it's it's, it's oh, amazing to hear your optimism. There's so many challenges uh, people are navigating in their personal lives and their professional lives uh, globally. Uh, many in our audience today uh, have been on the journey uh, to embed sustainability in their businesses for, for years, you know, some more than a decade. Uh, we also have educators and students with us today. Is there anything that, you know, comes to mind? Uh, and I admit, I have days where, particularly now, you know, the convergence of the, the climate crisis, uh, systemic racism, the economic, you know, challenges, it just is so overwhelming and it is just very heavy. Um, what advice would you have for someone like me who's just feeling a bit daunted about the road forward and, and how to take those steps and you know whether you're on the path and you're trying to get that momentum to keep going or you're just feeling anxiety and you know you want to take some first steps? Yeah, no I think the one thing that we have to really watch is that we are all healthy, you know, because without health you can't even do anything. And so, yes, we can just hope that we are not infected by anything, but then we can also influence our health, you know, lifestyle choices, nutritional choices, all that information is out there. So I think it really also does require a bit of self-initiative to get educated about that, be strong. And then I have to say, it is very daunting, but to me personally, you know, um, I have to say just to count one's blessings every day suddenly, you know, is such a fuel and motivator to, okay, um, tackle the challenge and find your group, find your community, find the like-minded people and go ahead and take that initiative and think out of the box, you know? And um, I think that's another thing. The box is kind of like going away anyway. So kind of any great, any great idea will be heard or can be heard. So let's go and problem solve, you know? And um, again, nowadays we have amazing means of having voices heard. So I think we can just be there for each other and support each other um, for the right uh, mission forward. And That's I need your advice more than, you know, we all, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I have I see there are an abundance of questions, so I'm actually just going to pose my last question to you, and then uh, make sure that we have time to address as many of them because they're, they're quite amazing questions. Um, I, I think that was very well said. Uh, and within fashion specifically, um, what would you like to see us do more, better, faster? <laughs> well, you know, I have to say, um, I think clean up the supply chain. So fashion is one of the biggest contributors to the um, pollution. Um, after the oil industry. And it's shocking to also read the statistics that 25% of the fashion produced is not even worn, worn and goes straight into the landfill. That's shocking. So I'm really hoping that through um, technology, there can be a better communication between the producer and the, and the consumer to really be more targeted, to create less waste. I think we need to educate ourselves about the supply chain, human slavery, again, shocking facts about that. Um, how can we just um, go ahead and manufacture in a more sustainable way, again, in terms of the dyes that are used and so on. But I really think it's the consumer that needs to um, ask for certain um, specifics in order for brands to manufacture in different ways. So I would love to see that speed up. I'd love to see less waste. Um, I think we're already seeing in the fashion industry, and this is what you know so much better than I do, the entire cycle's changing, the show's changing. It's been amazing to see how the fashion industry has been so agile and embracing to um, 
showing the collections in a digital way, it's worked. Um, I think we all miss the human interaction, but in terms of showing, you know, the collections, the digital means have certainly helped to support that. So, um, yeah, those are some of the things that I'd love to see change. Thank you. Uh, as I said, I have loads of questions, and I think I'm going to leave the questions specifically about the scholarship, uh, both the CFDI uh, Regener CFDI's Roski uh, Regeneration Innovation Scholar Award Scholarship, and um, uh, maybe if there's any additional information about creatives for a future. But um, a question uh, from our audience is, what is uh, the Swarovski's Foundation's highest priority for 2021? And uh, do you think you, how do you think you'll go about achieving that? Okay, so the highest priority, I mean, again, so I was talking about the three different pillars and then we were thinking, well, which pillar would, might we have to drop in order to have the biggest impact? So we also measure ourselves, actually. Uh, our first impact report is coming out in, a, no, not our first, but the next impact report is coming out in a month. Um, so I really, so right now this uh, Creative Source Future has really taken on tremendous momentum because we're touching so many uh, different topics. We're not just touching the environmental topics, but we're also talking the human empowerment topic because we're addressing equality. And I think um, our board of mentors also is a wonderful global representation. Um, so those are my, yeah, and education. It's so hard. It's it's and it actually, as it turns out, we've analyzed ourselves, but it turns out that every element um, interlinks with the other elements. So environment interlinks with education, um, interlinks with human empowerment. So, um, but I. So really, the the uh, the Swarovski Creative Source Future has now become a new blueprint. And I'm sorry, I'm just sharing with you my our, the team's brainstorm. As we've created this Swarovski Foundation, we call it Institute, we're changing that name, Creatives for the Future, which is really about creation, education, sustainability. We wanna really create an institute for water, specifically water and environment. So. Creatives for our future, um, from what I understand, just to share with our, our audience, is, is really positioned for uh, young talent, uh, 18 to 25, I believe. And it really brings together mentorship, as we've been talking about, um, and some of our uh, fantastic CFD board members being uh, leaders in that, uh, combined with with uh, grants and mentorship. Is that, uh, yep. sorry, it's mentorship tries. I love mentorship because it's education in action. Um, so the first cohort uh, is selected, I think, um, right. and they're going to get started soon. What if there's uh, listeners out there who would like to apply for the next round? Do you know how they can find out about that? Or is it yeah, an email? Oh so we were going to, um, we were aiming to already display um, the results at the what would have been the General Assembly, the UN General Assembly, which is usually in September. Okay. So that's when the, the result of this first initiative will take place. And I think we should, we need to launch the second initiative almost beforehand. So I think um, that's a good question. Let me discuss it with the team, but I think we could almost already accept the second round of applications. We just need to communicate that on our website. But, you know, as always, you have to start somewhere. And I'm sure the results that we'll see with this first um, selection of cohorts will inspire the next one. Um, and I have to say, it was a tough choice just to choose a few of those 375 um, applicants. And we totally appreciate um, even people reaching out and, and sending amazing presentations. Really, the world is not short of creativity. And, and a lot of that work will be powered also with the UNOP, the United Nations Office for Partnerships. So they'll have that opportunity to really, we started a conversation about the sustainable development goals. So they'll be able to really anchor their, their work to those. Absolutely. And I think um, for everyone here, uh, there is something also that this UN Office for Partnership has online. It's kind of, um, it's really focused on the fashion industry. I don't know, are you familiar with that? It's called the Conscious Fashion Campaign. Yes, yes, we are very, very 
fans of the Conscious Fashion campaign, and I know this month they have a digital exhibition. Uh, so that yeah. is great. So audience, uh, we'll send you follow-up information about that. Um, and then yeah. for the FDA and Swarovski's uh, scholarship, I'll, I'll just quickly share to the audience, that application is gonna be uh, shared with educators very soon. We're gonna be looking to make selections this summer and we'll be identifying for this year one scholar uh, and we'll be working together to, to announce that uh, between August and September. As you said, Nadia, it's a three year um, uh, collaboration or partnership. So um, we'll probably have a, a longer application round uh, for round two. And as you said, also that mentorship from cohort to cohort, I think it's going to be very exciting. So uh, if there's anyone uh, listening that is interested to learn more, we'll make sure that we share that with you. Um, and I think that I'm just going to just take a quick read through. Please forgive me. Um, jumping out of education, uh, and we have just a few moments left, so does anybody that would love to send through a question, please do. But Nadia, uh, there's a really great question here, um, and you touched on this a little bit, but uh, perhaps you can expand your thoughts, your point of view. Um, the question is, that becoming more sustainable is an ongoing journey for brands. Where would you suggest a brand starts as they begin their sustainability journey? An existing brand or a brand new brand? I'm going to say a, an existing brand. Because actually that's because a lot harder. <laughs> it is a lot harder, I know. <laughs> you can choose it's a new brand. Any organization is aware of their supply chain. Yes. And usually companies have their auditing committee, but um, you know, it's really a matter of looking at the supply chain. And as I said, a lot of things are not governmental requirements. But it's really a question that companies need to ask themselves: What, what, where's their moral compass? How clean do they want to be? Um, and I, yeah, it's just a matter of analyzing that and just cleaning it. Whenever it is necessary, and again, you know, you can things don't happen from today to yesterday, so it takes a while. And even if the effort is there, the effort is expressed. To make change that's fantastic you know and although i'm a big advocate for for sustainability and being clean you know what one shouldn't demotivate by being too judging either you know so i think um the industry just needs to um that's support each other cool. yes i'm coming <laughs> it's my okay. <laughs> no, no, no. So, but in any case, um, I think it's just uh, looking at your supply chain and seeing how you can change things. And, you know, I just know that the solutions are out there um, on better manufacturing, more sustainable fact manufacturing. Often it's just a company's decision whether they want to be sustainable or not, because often that also means a financial commitment. But you know, sooner or later it will become a governmental requirement. So sooner or later that investment will be will have to be made. And quite frankly, if that investment for better manufacturing is made, it's the best investment any brand or company can make. It's basically Absolutely. in our future. It's it's investing in the protection of our planet and people. Absolutely. And at the CFDA, we have a resident supply chain expert, uh, Cal McNeil, who's led our, our manufacturing initiatives and you know, is deepening uh, on our resource hub. Uh, a lot of focus to materials uh, are in the pipeline for the CFDA uh, with Cal and his team because, uh, as you know, it's really the largest area of impact. And I think one of the largest opportunities for innovation, you know, as we talk about really you know, the nexus of, of why you're focusing on careers for a future, why the collaboration across sectors. We know we need, you know, bio uh, materials to really put circularity in action. So couldn't agree with you more. And I love that you asked if it was a, a startup or an existing, because it's so much more challenging to transform an existing supply chain than it is a circular one from the ground up. I wanted to tell you, and maybe that's something um, we should talk about, but we'll share it in front of the group, but we're also working with MIT. Um, and we have a program called SOLVE. And again, that is really focusing, it's a coalition for social impact and social entrepreneurship. Um, it's connecting the startups with knowledge, with funding, resources. And again, the advantage here of just working with such universities is again, it's 
total creative problem solving. You know, these people, these kids, these students are coming up with new ways of doing things. And I really think science and the technology needs to feed right into fashion, you know? So um, as the digital space moved into sales, like, you know, remember a time I wasn't quite sure, is it a retail salesperson? Is it a digital salesperson? How do they differ? Well, actually, you know, and I think this is the same thing now. We really, science needs to be so much a part of fashion. So Absolutely. I think it's really exciting. The knowledge Absolutely. is out there and the, the brain power, the human brain power is out there. Seeing, uh, you know, the cradle to cradle, you know, philosophy of, of waste as food, you know, uh, and many of the post food uh, uh, waste uh, materials that are being pipelined and now carbon becoming food in essence or ingredients for materiality. Mm -hmm. It's super, mm -hmm. super fascinating. And mm -hmm. I just can't say thank you enough. I'm just mindful of your time and uh, that you were able to spend this Earth Day with us means everything. And thank you again. We are so excited to partner and support future talent together to continue more than 15 years of uh, incredible relationship. Um, you know, Stephen's listening today, our CEO, and uh, just look forward to, to seeing what, what blooms from, from the scholarship we're launching together, Nadia. Well, I can only say likewise. Thank you so much. And, you know, um, yeah, we're so grateful. We love, appreciate, and respect the CFDA so much. So this is really, to me, it means so much. And Stephen has always been so wonderful to work with. I'm so grateful, and your entire team. So I'm really excited about this new chapter and I'm excited about the creative exchange. Oh, well, on behalf of us all, thank you. It's been an honor really to, to hear from you. And um, to our audience, um, please look for follow-up email. We'll make sure you have all the information about the initiatives we spoke about today. Mm -hmm. Great. And thank you all for listening and everyone be well, be safe and be healthy. And we shall talk soon. Bye, Nadia. Thank Take you. Care. Sarah, we'll talk soon.